Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And we are so honored to be joined by the co-editors of Never Whistle at Night, an indigenous dark fiction anthology, Shane Hawk and Ted Van Elst. Welcome, guys. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. It is absolutely our pleasure. We are so excited to get to promote the book and talk to y'all about the process in which it was made and uh, maybe some indigenous traditions that get highlighted in the book. How about to get us started, you could tell the listeners a little bit about what the anthology is all about. Sure. So it came about basically from Twitter, which no one really likes anymore, but uh, it's where we all grew our careers. Um, We made things happen on Twitter. But anyways, um, someone named Bear basically put out an awesome tweet that said, hey, when are we going to get a, you know, a native horror anthology? And so Ted came across it first. And Ted actually had this idea brewing for years. And then he tagged me in it. And we just started getting the ball rolling. I think neither me or Ted were thinking that we were going to be at the helm of it. We were thinking like maybe we could help organize it, uh, make it happen. And then just on a whim, I just started, I don't know, taking the reins, I guess. And I started private messaging um, established, you know, native authors and saying, hey, would you be able to put a horror story together? We're reaching out to people that weren't really horror writers you know, mostly in like literary circles. And everyone said yes. So it kept (laughs) snowballing. And it was just amazing. Ted and I were originally thinking, you know, maybe a Kickstarter, GoFundMe, something to kind of, you know, launch it. Then our our buddy Gabino Iglesias was trying to help us out, land an agent for this project and maybe have an indie, you know, an indie publisher pick it up. And then... um. I kept going around and getting more names on my list to, you know, try to write something for this thing. And I came across uh, Shri Demoline. She was one of the only people that I had to speak to via an agent. Um, Everyone else was just an unprofessional DM. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, her agent, Rachel, said, you know, Shri's like really down for this. Uh, She's excited. It sounds really cool. Do you guys have representation? And um, by that time, I was like, like, what does she mean by that? <laughs> like an agent? or So we had a phone call, and then she was excited about the project after I tried to explain it. Basically, half established names, half open call. And she was like, okay, let's go. You want to sign with me? And then she became my literary agent. It's pretty crazy. And then from there, we wrote a proposal and shopped it out to Big Five. So, like, our minds were blowing. We were like, what? <laughs> There's... <laughs> These big cats and you know New York and stuff. You know we're we're from the indie scene really, and so it was all mind blowing. We had crazy conference calls. I was substitute teaching at the time, and I was begging the principal, "Can I use your conference room? You know, some private space so I can take these serious phone calls." And um, yeah, we landed with Penguin Random House. So three different imprints, a global deal. That's like the big one of the big five. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the behemoth. <laughs> and yeah, we we luckily landed with Anna Kaufman, who's been more than gracious during this whole process. Yeah, we love her so much. She's at Vintage. Yeah, it's it all started from a tweet. And then now we're, you know, on the precipice of releasing it this September. And... Yeah. <laughs> the internet makes things happen. It is does. what I've discovered talking to a bunch of authors and and editors and stuff like that. It's like the internet just makes things happen because you can find community there that you might not be able to find elsewhere in the real world, so to speak. So Yeah, really. That's amazing. That's so so cool. Um a lot of us are signing up for Blue Sky mm-hmm. if we can get an invite. You know, speaking of making things happen where maybe you couldn't in real life. We got our anthology in the eyes, in front of the eyes of Neil Gaiman. He's like, whoa, yeah, send me this. This sounds cool. That's incredible. So we're going to send, you know, a copy to Neil Gaiman now. It's pretty neat. Amazing. 
truly amazing. My dream, personally, is what you just said there. <laughs> yeah. No, especially for all kinds of communities and, like, queer and Jewish writers I know have had the same um, experiences where people who would dismiss a query or a phone call as, like, oh, well, the audience for that might be too niche or, oh, this might be, you know, too complex or not, quote, marketable, which is a word people love to use in offices to, like, dismiss entire <laughs> communities. Yeah. Um, you can say, um, actually, I have demonstrated interest and there are whole communities that you can sell shit to and who want to buy this kind of thing. Yeah, for sure. Now, Ted, for you, how was the experience of getting to work with all of these authors and reaching out and everyone seemingly being so excited to be a part of it? It's been really wild to see this come together in this organic sort of way. I mean, the democratization of the internet can be wild at almost all times and it can be ugly and it can be beautiful, right? So this is one of those really good moments. I started thinking about this anthology or I started thinking about collecting this in some way. It was a long time ago. I was sitting there and it was a Native Lit conference. And so we have lots of Native folks and allied people, people in the discipline. And I noticed this thing over a couple of years, uh, we'd be sitting in the hotel lobby, say, and just kind of telling stories, right? And then when those folks went to bed, it was like just Native people sitting around, we would tell the spooky stories or the story of this happened and that happened. And I'm like, there's something happening here. So I'm like, well, let me try to do a little bit of research. And there was a, I don't know if it's still up or not, but on Facebook, right, because I'm old, I'm on Facebook for like, 15 years, mm -hmm. there was a group, it was like native ghost stories. And there are literally 10,000 plus of these stories in this Facebook group. Wow. So, you know, there are all kinds of different stories out there. And I'm like, man, we have so many cool stories. And I'm like, and every native story, you know, just by the fact of its existence is post-apocalyptic, right? Mm -hmm. So we're living through some really wild stuff here. And so you have a sort of mix of traditional stories, new story. You can see where new influences will come into an older story, maybe, because you know, now you have a car or whatever happens, right? And so thinking about that, when I saw this, and Shane and I connected just on Twitter because of horror and you know mutual interest and stuff like that. And then this started circulating. I'm like, huzzah. Yes, we, <laughs> I, we can do this, but is the time right, right? And so it just got this... And you could just see it sort of coming together. And like Shane said, everybody, I mean, we have like big names, you know, uh, who are like, oh yeah, I'm down. I totally got a story. I could totally do this. And there, are, you know, in looking at editing, because like, I edited a collection of Stephen Graham Jones' work back in 2015, The Faster Rudder Road. And so thinking about how all these stories might come together, listening to people talking, there was this immediate um, response. And there are very few trunk stories. I think people were like jazzed, like, oh yeah, this is the moment, right? And maybe the story was trunked in their head or, or whatever, but man, the stories just started coming. They started coming pretty quick. And Shane and I, in talking and, and coming from, you know, in, I mean, I published with University Press. I have a couple of my own things out, but basically independent, like how this might look, we were really committed to having an open call portion because we know there are so many writers, especially in our community, that don't get looks from the big five, from big publishers, editors, agents. And so we thought this would be an opportunity to get some stories out there. And I've seen some reviews and three of the four, like these bangers, like three of those came from the open call. It's incredible. So I know that we, you know, we did the right thing in doing this. And, you know, yeah, we got an advance and all this stuff, but we paid all the authors like right up front. We just, we, you know, we got everybody paid. That was really important to do that. So to see it come together in this way and to gauge the interest thus far and what the feedback has been from the press has been really satisfying. Yeah, definitely. We love to hear it. Yeah, it's great to see it in those reviews. And I mean, my opinion is of all this, I love all the stories, but the opinion of other people, they're seeing this stuff. And now uh, the reviews are like, I've been introduced to writers that I really want to read now, right? And so this should give other folks momentum to get out there. And I, you know, I sent my novel off to Rachel, our agent on this, and she's like, Maybe not for me, but I know who might like this. So now I got an agent out of it too. And I was like, there goes all my indie cred, you know, I'm a punk rocker from way back and always in my own promotion. So it's been really shifting, like life shifting in that way. I never, ever thought I would have be represented by an agent, like a cool agent, right? Who represents Getty Lee too, right? So, I mean, that's just wild for me. It's really cool. It's been a really good ride so far. Yeah. And like the amazing part is like, and we talk about this a lot in like publishing or in like any creative space, like 
getting the door open for yourself and then holding the door open for people behind you. And this project in general feels like something of that spirit. Definitely. Yeah, it was really important for the open call because... I don't know, like we, we were trying to do our market research and I don't think it had been done at that level before. So we were trying to make strides and changing things for natives all around. You know, natives in the whole publishing industry is like 1%. So we're trying to increase that. And just the open call portion of it, you know, we, we fielded calls where some editors were saying like, mm, you know, no name authors, it's really hard, you know, tough sell. So let's reduce your number. You know, we're, we're originally aiming for like seven stories, I think it was. It was a soft number. And then um, I remember one of our phone calls, they were like, um, how about one or two? That's it. <laughs> so they wanted like all big names and then maybe one or two smaller name, you know, emerging writers. And Ted and I were like, uh, yeah, I'm not sure about that. And then uh, something that, you know, made our eyes go wide with Anna at Vintage was her question before we ended the phone call was, are you tied to that seven number? You know, how about eight, nine, ten? There you go. And here we are with, you know, basically 50-50 of open call and established names. So it's all very cool. Amazing. A sign of a great agent in that case. She's the so. goods. Yeah, we love to see it. <laughs> yeah. She's the goods for sure. Yeah. So I want to ask this question because I feel like this is a good segue into why our listeners should pick up the book, besides the fact that it's featuring some wonderful Native writers, but the title. Someone might look at that title and be like, never whistle at night. Why would you not whistle at night? Can you guys talk a little bit about the story of why you shouldn't whistle at night? At least maybe the story that you might have heard growing up and then why in general it is considered a bad thing to do. Yeah, I mean, my dad told me, I don't know, when I was maybe seven or eight, I think we were fishing and the sun was going down. And he jokingly just said, you know, hey, I know you like to whistle the music and stuff, but don't be whistling out here. And I was like, what are you talking about, dad? And so he explained to me, you know, if you ever, you know, he heard this from his dad, basically, Hidatsa, basically, you know, if you hear a whistle, don't answer back with the whistle. Or just don't, in general, whistle because you might invite um, a spirit to latch on to you and bring it home within the confines of your, you know, your home. So it's kind of like inviting it in. You know, sometimes he had stories of possession, you know, where the spirit can actually go inside of you and control you and stuff. And so that always creeped me out. And actually my story within, you know, both Ted and I wrote a story for this anthology too. And, uh, it's a possession story, basically based on a family lore story from my dad and grandpa. So it's, you know, half fiction, half fact. <laughs> <laughs> when Ted and I were brainstorming a title, we chose the umbrella term dark fiction, right? Because we, you know, it's, you have to sadly put some marketing thought into there instead of just kind of being punk rock and like, you know, F it, let's just name it what we want. But dark fiction, I think we chose that because it's, softer than horror, even though a lot of these stories are pretty hardcore. Um, it kind of invites more readers to kind of delve into horror because, you know, maybe they they only know horror as hostile or saw, mm. and then they don't know what, you know, horror can bring. So we went with that umbrella term. And then thinking about Never Whistle at Night, Ted and I were really thinking about, okay, what's, you know, we're trying to get stories from natives from all over. Mm. And our open call, you know, we didn't really have a ton of help Vintage and Penguin, they couldn't help us with the open call portion. It was all on us because of some laws. And so, you know, our social media following was pretty small, but our our reach was, we were trying to go for global indigenous stories, you know, from all over. Um, and we did re- receive some from all over. But in the end, um, I think the strongest stories ended up being, you know, those indigenous to the North America, above the imaginary border and, you know, down here. And we're trying to think of a universal kind of a a warning title because that's some of our favorite titles in horror movies. Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to think of a kind of, you know, we weren't trying to go for something like Pan-Indian, but something that really spoke to a lot of different peoples, you know, in the creepy kind of way. And, you know, both me and Ted definitely knew about Whistling at Night. And um, we're just kind of throwing ideas back and forth. I think it was just a text message. And um, I think Ted came up with 
whistling at night. And then I kind of spun it with like the VHS horror title, like mm-hmm. never whistle at night. Yeah. Yeah. Kinda like a warning. So good. Now all the stories go into this idea that, hey, what if you do whistle at night? It's not, you know, a theme that way. It's just the title that we chose because it's kind of universal in a horror, creepy kind of way, like a warning. It's the sort of never whistle at night or else, right? Yeah. And, and that's the implied part. And then you open the book, what happens? All these things kind of happen, right? <laughs> and so I think we got it. And one of the things I wanted to add when Shane was talking, we tried to go for as large a reach as possible. This book will be simultaneously released in the U.S. and Canada. So there's, there are people involved on both sides of that border. And you know, to have people like Wab Rice and Richard Van Camp and Cherie Dimeline, I'm really excited to see both the reception, but, but how it's doing. The first thing I got asked to do off of this book is for the Toronto Public Library series. Hell yeah. So I'm really, really excited for that. And having people in our family that come from both sides of that border, that's really important to me. So yeah, having lived up north for a long time, people like to read. I was like, don't sleep on Canada. Boy, those people like to read and they are <laughs> dedicated to their books. So I'm, I'm excited for it to come out up there too. That's fair. Not a lot to do in the wintertime when there's like three feet of snow outside. Exactly. Like you're, you're inside <laughs> reading probably. <laughs> Might as well read and not whistle. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like a lot of times in, and this is an unfortunate thing, but in kind of the Western colonial mind, a lot of the stories of like Native and Indigenous people tend to be like squished together. Like, oh, well, obviously the stories of the uh, the Cherokee are going to be the same as the Algonquin is the same as the Pueblo or something like that. And I think that this is a great way of like showing like no these traditions are in fact like while there like might be somewhat of a through line like there's not necessarily like these are not the same people sharing the same exact stories was that something that you wanted to highlight in choosing either how the stories were ordered or something in choosing the stories that you chose you bring up a good point sort of for the overculture there's this you know, and I always go back to like remember the maps when we were little kids Right. There's all of North America and there's like some Mohegans in a wigwam. And there's this, there's just these like, like this sparsely populated. And so why wouldn't it be the same? But we're the most diverse of the diverse groups, right? When you talk about diverse group, what are we at? 576 federally recognized tribes, hundreds of state recognized tribes. There's a lot of diversity there. And I, I think there wasn't an active per se choosing of, you know, like geographic diversity or tribal diversity. It just happened pretty naturally in that way. And Mm. for me, I'm a city kid. I'm an urban kid. I grew up in Chicago. So it's very important to me, you know, most folks live in urban areas now. And so it was really important to me to show, okay, yeah, there's this, this takes place in the city as well. So I wrote a very Chicago, even a South Side story. So it was really important to me that we, that we have that. And I think we've shown, you know, from Alaska down to the desert outside of Tucson and, you know, from the West Coast city. I think we, we've covered really a large, large area within that just sort of naturally happened that way, which was really exciting too. Yeah, I mean, um, for Story Order, the most important thing wasn't really grouping, you know, ideas or concepts outside of tribes and, you know, trying to make thematic sections. I think because it's a horror anthology, we're concentrating mostly on like the roller coaster of emotions. And so the way um, we kind of structured it was, you know, hills and valleys, <laughs> just like they amp up and they kind of calm down a little bit. A little relief, a little pause. Yeah, different lengths. And so I think basically the final order is a really good selection of, you know, going up, down, up, down, and not trying to jar the reader with too much gross or too much, you know, slow burner. You know, so that's what we were trying to do with the story order. You got a little comic relief in there, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, natives are funny, man. Yeah, man, for <laughs> real, for real. Yeah, there, there is, you know, this thing that we're trying to combat online, even in, you know, reviews of my own collection, Anoka, is this idea of indigenous culture as like monolithic or Native American language. I, I come across these posts all the time that, how do you say blah, blah, blah in Native American? What the hell? <laughs> you know, 
Yeah. Come Whoa, on. that's a lot of languages, bro. Yeah. Do one Google. <laughs> yeah, right. One Google. Yeah. Seriously, I I just came across a Quora post that said that. Oh boy. <laughs> or it's like, you know, people that just don't know, but I don't like preaching to people, but I like, you know, through entertaining, kind of teaching people, I guess. I'm a, you know, I'm a high school history teacher. Um, so I guess I do like lecturing, but. Um, <laughs> Only in half hour chunks. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Right. Well, my classes are two hours. It's a little <gasps> oh, tough. Oh, wow. But um, yeah, it's, so it's, it's weird. You have to sort of educate through your stories and make sure people don't think that there is one indigenous culture, which I keep seeing on Twitter and Facebook and kind of everywhere, just this idea that, oh, it's all the same, you know, even down to the stories. And there is overlap in a lot of tribes, like all the tribes that I'm, you know, either enrolled or a descendant of are Plains tribes. And there's a lot of overlap with stories, you know, like with the Arapaho, um, little people are very evil. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And some other tribes, you know, they're more (laughs) mischievous. So there's definitely overlap, shared legends, shared, you know, beliefs, ideas, but it's important to not kind of paint all of us with one brushstroke, I guess. And hopefully this antho shows it. I think one, one of the things maybe for your listeners that it's important to talk about here, when Shane's talking about educating and other things, it made me think of how whether, you know, it's a something in the popular realm like Smoke Signals or it's a book that everybody loves or any other kind of media production it's really important to not read those as ethnographies, right? Mm -hmm. People write fiction, people make movies. It's not a documentary, you know, and I teach literature and film, so I'm really cognizant of this thing. And that's the case here too. Not all of these stories are based on legends. They're not always based on, you know, a traditional story. Some people are just straight up writing like slam and fiction, right? They want to write a good story, something that, you know, is dark and, and has this, this nominal relation, like I talked about in this post-apocalyptic world, but the artistic and cultural production of Native people is often taken as either utilitarian or ethnographic. And that's the wrong way to read that. You know, you have to, you have to experience people as human beings who are just trying to create something. And while people are embedded in their culture, it's really important to them, that whether it's their spiritual traditions or whatever it happens to be, not everything they produce for consumption is about that or telling about that. Sometimes it's just like, you know, it's for the aesthetic quality. We just want to create art mm-hmm. and, and, you know, you just want to be a good human and make good art some days. And it's not always about teaching, but if people learn something on the way, you're doing your job. So when you look at it that way, I think I want readers and listeners to know these are, some of these are based, some of these are traditional, some of these are just straight up like, well, let's get wild, let's tell this story in this way. So yeah, the cautionary piece is to not not go, wow, all those Lapan Apaches are just like that, you know? And no, it's just one person, one artist doing their thing. So I think, I think that's an important part maybe to bring up. Mm. Yeah, no, that 100% makes sense. And, you know, one person can only tell the story of themselves and their own experiences. And I, that's such a great point. Thank you so much for bringing that up, Ted. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, and hopefully a amount of creative freedom and relief provided to your authors when, you know, you're not the single Indigenous story or the single Native American contributor to an anthology. Yeah. You know, you're in good company among 20 plus other authors doing the same thing. And hopefully the next, you know, 5, 10, 15 projects greenlit at other publishers after they see the strong sales record and great reception to Never Whistle <laughs> at Night means that you can have the different collections, intersections, different freedoms afforded to writers besides that, like, oppressive weight of, of like, token or being the single representation in a given group. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So many more questions that we want to ask you guys. But first, we need to take a quick break and go grab a refill. Let's do it. Hello, hello. Welcome to the refill. Welcome, most of all, to our newest patrons, Chris, Joey, and Lavi Boem. Now, uh, Lavi, you are not the person who corrected me in one of our patron only features that I incorrectly did math based on there being 575,600 minutes in a year. In fact, it is 525,600 minutes in a year. That's on me. Uh, but uh, thank you for reminding me by signing up for Patreon to listen to Rent. And I did spend the entire weekend listening to the soundtrack 
soundtrack on repeat. So welcome to the Patreon and welcome and thank you to all of you who have committed to supporting this independent podcast with your hard-earned human dollars. We can only do this because of the support that you give us on Patreon. So please, if you have an extra few bucks in your budget during the month, this is a great time. Help us finish the year strong and come on, go to patreon.com slash spirits podcast. Thanks as well to our supporting producer level patrons, Alicia Ann, Fruity Chick, Ginger Spurs Boy, Hannah, Jack Marie, Jane, Measlekins, Lily, Matthew, Nathan, Phil Fresh, Rico Lake, Captain Jonathan Malachi, Cosmos, Sarah, and Scott. And our legend level patrons, Ariana, Audra, Bex, Chibi Yokai, Morgan H, Sarah, and BME Up, Scotty. Now, I don't know if you remember, but Julia let you know last week that we do have new merch for sale. If you go to spiritspodcast.com slash merch, we have an updated logo t-shirt, five tarot card designs on a black t-shirt. I know some of you are like, love the tarot design, don't necessarily want a green shirt. There you go. You got a black t-shirt now and you can choose your design. It's amazing. Go check it out. This week, I would like to recommend a book that I, I haven't been this excited to get a physical book in a very long time. I try very hard only to buy books that I know I'm going to want to reread because uh, two English majors live in my house and we have a lot of books. And I picked up Mercury Stardust's Safe and Sound, a renter-friendly guide to home repair. Now, I'm a, a medium handy person. I grew up, you know, like hanging pictures and fixing stuff and, you know, like making sure my door frames aren't squeaky, my hinges, etc. But Mercury does an incredible job of making lots of different kinds of home repair tasks, especially for renters like me, incredibly easy to understand. I love her TikToks. I love her content. But her book is really, really something else. She is a New York Times bestseller now. I'm so proud of her. And there are definitely independent bookstores near you, or if not, bookshop.org, where you can go ahead and pick up Safe and Sound. As always, all of the books we recommend on the show and that are written by our guests are listed on spiritspodcast.com slash books. Now, lots going over at Multitude, as always. And this week, I'd love to tell you about Games and Feelings, where I was just a guest on a live show in Manchester, England. My first live show outside the country and my first one in person in quite a while. So it was so exciting. And I love that show. It's an advice podcast all about games of every kind. Video games, tabletop games, party games, laser tag, escape rooms, all those kinds of things. And if you want compassionate advice and some really interesting insights into to the games industry, you got to go ahead and check it out. Go to gamesandfeelings.com or look for Games and Feelings in your podcast app. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. And I actually come and record these mid-rolls after therapy pretty often. And I was saying to my therapist today how exciting it is to have someone to help me figure out goal setting. It's something that I don't always give a ton of attention to in my day-to-day -day life. I'm like, oh, yeah, I got this. I know what I'm doing. It's easy to get overwhelmed with kind of the like day-to-day -day responsibilities and forget that, you know, I got to think about like big picture stuff every once in a while. And therapy is a really, really good place to talk about it. I know that until I was able to find a therapist who was affordable and taking new patients and I kind of got along with who could see me in person here in New York City, which has like thousands of therapists, I couldn't for many years. And BetterHelp was super, super helpful during that time. So if you're thinking of starting therapy soon, if you can't safely access therapy in person where you are now, if you're looking for something to kind of bridge the gap or you want to kind of dip your toe in and try it, try BetterHelp. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash spirits today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash spirits. We are also sponsored this week by Ravensburger. Now, this is a fabulous sponsor that I'm so excited to have on the show, and lots of you are as well. And you can go ahead and enjoy, honestly, the most high-quality jigsaw puzzles there are. They are kind of like the top name in jigsaw puzzles. You may not know their name necessarily, but if you look at the logo on the puzzle box, you're like, oh, yeah, those are like the good puzzles that I keep in the closet and don't like re-gift or donate because they are really, really good. They date back to 1883 three, actually. And they've been a part of people's lives for generations, really. And if you want to, like me, kind of take a moment to, you know, listen to a podcast or music, or maybe just clear your head and do something with your hands that 
you are going to feel really accomplished at the end of a puzzle is incredible. They have puzzles from just like nine or 10 pieces all the way up to 40,000 pieces. Maybe one day I'll have a table big enough for that. But I know my grandma and I love to trade Ravensburger puzzles because we know they are high quality, they're beautiful, and you're really going to enjoy it. So go ahead and check out Ravensburger puzzles on Amazon at your local game or hobby store or on their website. We have a link in the description. Again, that's Ravensburger Jigsaw Puzzles. And now let's get back to the show. We are back, and what have you guys been enjoying lately in terms of drinks, cocktails, mocktails, what have you? Like, what's been your your drink of choice lately? Man, I was in this restaurant, Shane, before we go back, and, and I was with my bro, and they, they don't drink alcohol at all, right? So he's like, can I get an Arnold Palmer? And the waiter's like, how about a John Daly? I'm like, no, don't. He goes, what's that? I'm like, don't, 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 don't. He's like, I'm making don't Arnold Palmer me. just dump vodka in it. You're going to love it. I'm like, no, don't do that, man. Don't do that. <laughs> John Daly. Nah. Uh, teenage Julia has had too many of those, I think. Yeah. <laughs> John Daly's. <laughs> Yeah, it was funny. Um, I recently went to Pittsburgh for StokerCon, and I'm from San Diego, so I grew up with, I don't really drink a lot, right? So I had a heavy drinking period from 21 to like 26, and I kind of just do it for celebratory reasons now. And I kind of wanted to get fucked up over there, so I asked them for AMF, or Adios Motherfucker. (laughs) That's a very popular, well-known drink over here. And they're like, what did you just say? (laughs) (laughs) What are you asking for? Are you asking for a blue Long Island iced tea? And I was like, I guess. <laughs> oh no! You make that for me, and I guess it was kind of like, kind of the same. So I was like, uh, I was the only guy at the bar with that blue drink, but it was fun. Oh, I man. went to Philadelphia and asked my favorite thing to get out is like a beer shot combo. I just think they're really interesting. People do them different ways and like interesting combinations. Mm-hmm. And in Philly, I was so excited to get the citywide, like the Philly version of that. I went to three different bars and asked for one. They were like, I don't know, man. And I was like, I- I've been misled by culture. I-, I don't know what I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> Someone on TikTok lied. Yes. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Chicago's the boiler maker. That's the just, you know, that's the mm. standard, mm. you know, well whiskey dropped mm. in a draft or whatever. But man, I had my my daughter's an archaeologist and she had this conference here and this Pawnee bro, this like nephew of mine, we were at we were at this bar and I get this charge like i'm like for an amf i'm like dude what are you doing man he goes oh uh, he venmoed me the money and i sent it back to him but i'm like dude yeah, dude it's on him to make a good impression on you <laughs> right yeah. what are you doing yeah. you want me to help with your dissertation you should probably not charge drinks to my cards like yeah. <laughs> amazing <laughs> Something else I am really excited about in reading this anthology and in recommending it to our listeners and that I think they'll also be really jazzed about is reminding non-Native readers that Native American histories are ongoing and cultures are present, vibrant, growing and not a relic of the past, which is a you know narrative of colonialism that we as a culture don't do a great job of undoing. And so often uh, when we run into the presence of Indigenous people in horror and in dark fiction, They may be a specter of the past. And so how did you guys approach kind of writing and editing a vibrant, current, contemporary anthology of horror involving Native Americans that is not a archaeological and historical relic of the past? I would say it was all on the writer's shoulders. Um, They came at us with, you know, incredibly poignant contemporary stories, you know, Another thing that we have to combat online, you know, on Goodreads, Twitter, et cetera, is the assumption that you're a native horror, you know, writer. Why isn't there folklore in this story? Mm. Or where's the legend? Where's Thunderbird? You know? So we had very loose guidelines because we don't like to restrict creativity. We just said, hey, you know, we know that you're not, not all of them, but Quite a few of the writers, you know, are more literary, you know, outside of genre to an extent. And we just said, hey, just write us a creepy, cool story. You get to choose the subject. You get to choose everything about it. Just make it creepy. Make it, uh, sell it to us. Make it really fun, engaging. We didn't say, hey, you have to, um, you know, you have to talk about treaties. You don't have to talk about blood quantum. They just kind of 
came up with things and we kind of, you know, handpicked things that cover pretty much everything. It was just all on them, really, you know, including Ted and I, we have 26 stories. So 24 outside of us. And they're all just amazing, you know, wide ranging, covering all sorts of things, boarding schools, blood quantum, Catholic church, just all sorts of things, even traditional stories. And sorry, I think that is my cat behind me, Poso. Perfect. <laughs> so I think maybe, I'm trying to think if there are historical, and, and probably the oldest one's mine is set in the 70s, because because to me, I just missed the 70s, growing up in the 70s, and all the fun stuff happened. Then. So, <laughs> hey, mine's in the 70s. <laughs> you, you missed a lot, man. Um, I think. I think every one of them is pretty contemporary. They may draw on historical moments, but for the most part, the settings are contemporary. And I think that was an unintended good thing, right? That people will be like, oh, it's not the myths and legends. And I, I think there's something that happens there in the desire for myths and legends. I think the overculture desires Native people to be myths and legends as well. Like yeah. They, yeah. Whether whether assimilation, relocation, reservation, peer, all of those things is to sort of... Meh, push us into the past, right? It's always the, the, the dying Indian trope or whatever. Exactly. Elsewhere, a relic of the past. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. a thing you can engage with for thrilling jollies. Like, it's a gross impulse no matter how you slice it. One of my favorite directors, Jim Jarmusch, was like in an interview, he's like, it was, it's a terrible thing. He goes, but Americans see Indians like dinosaurs. Mm. Like, these are things of the past that don't exist, you know? And even though he made Dead Man set long ago, I think he, he's very he's very aware of, you know, Gary Farmer and Ghost Dog and things like that. I mean, he's he's one of those guys that gets it a little bit. So and it's nice to know that these are all very contemporary for the most part. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking on that, just um, trying to combat the idea that, you know, like the magical Negro trope, yeah. we have to deal with sort of that kind of thing in <laughs> Native circles is... Well, not within Native circles, but from outsiders, basically. Where's the medicine man? You know, where's uh, where's the curse? The wise elder. The burial grounds and all of that. <laughs> yeah, like they, they did in Antlers, yeah. sort of. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. In terms of horror, because you are both horror writers, what is it about that genre? I know that we, we talked about classifying this anthology in particular as dark fiction, but your background is horror. What is it about horror that drew you to it as a genre as a whole? Mm, well, I'm a latecomer for horror fiction because I'm a late bloomer with reading. I read as a, a child and then I just kind of died and I became a movie buff. I guess it's lazier, it's more passive. <laughs> but I didn't start reading till I was, well, seriously reading till I was 26 and going back to college and trying to get my degree and stuff. Um, but there was just a big kind of blank area where I just kind of read maybe one or two books. And I got into horror like, well, I've always been into horror movies. You know, let's get that straight, I guess. Mm -hmm. I mean, my dad pranked me when uh, Blair Witch came out. Um, on VHS and told me he found it at a garage sale. No! And said, hey, let's, he tore off the label and said, hey, let's uh, let's watch this. I just bought it at this neighbor's garage sale. Let's see what's on it. That's and I think so he fast forwarded it, you know, past all the credits and all that and like just showed shaky cam. Oh my God. Like, As a nine year old, I was like, what the hell is this? This is the creepiest thing. And I was just haunted. And then, um, Shane, did your dad want a horror writer as a kid? Because it feels like he kind of engineered this for you. It's possible, yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, upon growing up, I think we all, everyone in my family has an inclination for horror or like horrific things. It's kind of weird. Like my, my aunt, she cleans bloody uh, medical devices and stuff, like all the organs. Wow. And, oh, I don't know. But um, I'm not sure if I could do that, but... Um, I don't know. I've always been drawn to the dark stuff. You, you can describe <laughs> it. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, he showed me slashers as a kid. And then, you know, later on, I was 27, I think, 2017, uh, my wife started to tell me to read these literary horror books like Brian Evanson, uh, Michael Wee Hunt. And I was like, okay, this is pretty rad. I kind of like this a lot. And so I started to do a deep dive into horror. You know, I still have a lot of catching up to do. But what really made me a horror writer was Stephen Graham Jones's um, Mapping the Interior. I read that summer 2019. 
And it just kind of blew my mind. I felt like it was written for me. This is before I interacted with anyone on Twitter. You know, I was kind of like a loner, kind of like self-isolated, not really connecting with, you know, the writer world yet. So I didn't know who Steven was. I didn't really delve into, you know, native fiction that much at that point either. Just fiction in general, because I was trying to read the whole world. And it really spoke to me. And I was like, man, this guy, he's Native American. And he's writing creepy stuff. And it blows your mind. And maybe I can try this too. Not saying I'm going to be on his level ever, but at least try to take a stab at it. Try to create my own kind of creepy stories. And that's what really pushed me. And then um, I became a teacher and went into that program to get a credential. And that was hell in a, in a way for like being busy. And so I didn't really write any short stories until summer 2020. And then that's when I put out my collection. And that's kind of where it all started with Stephen Graham Jones. And then it's weird to call him a friend now and, <laughs> you know, have dinner with him and, and uh, you know, book editors and stuff. It's crazy. Amazing. That's amazing. What a journey. Yeah. Wild. I was an early reader. So, I mean, I read the Decameron. I was like eight or nine. I was one of those weirdo kids. And definitely through film, I, we were talking about this uh, the other night. My uh, youngest has just graduated the film degree and really way into horror like like yes and i didn't do that i didn't i just it, they saw everything that i saw and, and they made their own choices <laughs> but the reading part growing up you know reading stephen king reading clive barker getting to meet clive barker things like that it, it just those things kind of shape you and they sort of build that little world around you but what i find really interesting being a comp, which is having a PhD in comp lit and literary theory and all those kind of things. And, and and the question was a good one because I hadn't really thought about it before. Was that, well, a lot of, particularly in the 80s and in that era, horror is really conservative. Right? Mm -hmm. This, this, you do this, this will happen to you. X, you know, A plus B equals C. But in fiction, it's different. It doesn't, you don't have those same constraints. And those constraints of horror as a genre are transferable, right? And so when you look at, just from a theoretical standpoint, when you talk about native fiction as being like magical realism, and it's not. It, native fiction is just native fiction. It's just realism, right? And so the horror genre allows space for you to introduce things, right, that you would have to explain otherwise. But because folks know what you're writing, what you're talking about, of course Coyote appears in this story because wh why wouldn't he? It's a Coyote moment. So Coyote shows up and they're like, well, is that a metaphor? No, it's not a metaphor. It's like it's like in Louise Erdrich's tracks, you know? Yeah. Does Pauline turn into an owl? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. How else is she going to sit on that branch like that? She's a big girl. She'd fall right out of the tree. So there's these kind of moments within that in both literary fiction, but in horror in particular, that allow you to introduce worlds with far less explanation for the reader, right? The expectations are different. And I think while maybe the, the film is conservative, the literature's totally liberating and, and you can do so much more with it. So thanks for bringing that up. Now I'm gonna have to nag my students and make them read more horror, so. <laughs> Yay. I'm always down for more students reading more horror. That's yes. just me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, the final question I wanted to ask y'all was featuring a story that both of you wrote in the collection. How did you go about approaching kind of what sort of story you wanted to tell? Because I don't know in the process if you wrote your stories first and then you did the editing of the collection or if you looked at what stories were being submitted and then decided, oh, brain blast, I'm going to write about this. So how did you go about picking the story that you ended up telling? You know, just going into it, I definitely wanted to include, you know, a story from my actual family and including some, I guess what people call family lore. I originally wrote the story around the time that we were doing the open call to kind of be respectful to the other writers too, kind of put myself on the same deadline. And then it was, I think I was talking to my grandma. Yeah. And um, she was kind of like iffy about me including that, that particular story. So, you know, to be respectful for, uh, to my grandma and my family, I think she just mostly didn't want it down in written word mm. and, you know, profitable and, you know, selling it. Mm -hmm. So I just went with a different story, you know, still from my dad, still about, you know, him and my grandpa out there 
um, hunting. That was the most important part was, I think it's really cool being able to, you know, transport back to the seventies, something I never experienced, (laughs) but just listening to my dad, sitting down with him, allowing him to describe how his childhood was, you know, he moved all over. He was, you know, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Utah, Colorado, and just him describing this small amount of time that he lived in uh, northeastern Utah and describing the way everything looked, smelled, his dog, his dad, um, how it was hunting in the winter, all that kind of thing. It was just really cool for me, kind of as a tribute to my grandpa, to also write a story that includes, um, you know, it's horrific, right? It's a horror story but also including indigenous joy and love in it. Because mm. there's, you know, moments in there where my dad gets to bond with his dad. And then upon, you know, sending my dad the drafts to read, he gets to kind of revisit those memories. Oh. So that was really cool for us. Amazing. I, you know, I, t- I took it as an opportunity to to do something different, but not too different, right? I, because I, I know when I'm in the space where I'm writing the best, right? I and mean, that's Chicago. But I want to do something different. So it's the first one set on the South Side, but I'm like, and I want to have fun with this. And the South Side's really different from the North Side. The South Side has this really apparent racism, where the North Side, it's a little more nuanced, right? <laughs> but I wanted to set the story out South. I wanted it to be different, but I wanted a monster, right? I want to write a monster story too. And I wanted to to sort of deconstruct racism, but it's it's not even, I don't know that we're ever going to deconstruct racism, but it's a good spot to make fun of it. So, ha ha, look what happened to these white people in this story, right? And they're, that's it. They're not central to the story. You think they are. They're not central at all. And so I got to write this really fun story and to make some commentary about things, about about allyship, about a lot of different things that happened in this story. And so I was really excited. And frankly, it took me longer to come up with a title for the story than to write it. Because I'm really kind of agonizing, how do I do this? And I'm a big fan of like Pixar, who who makes films for two audiences, right? For the kids, but also for the parents who take them, right? Mm -hmm. So we're always sort of working. I think that happens in Native Lit a lot. There's a lot of ha-ha moments, right? Like you watch Reservation Dogs, that's great, ha-ha-ha. And then people write you how come they barred the owl's eyes right because so there's two there's two stories happening within that at once and i just i like clever i like smart i like language i like to do all those kind of things but but that story i wanted to tell tell a good story set it out south challenge myself a little bit and set it in a in a different milieu right in a different sort of arena and i really i really like that story a lot something different for me and so this this whole project reminds me to keep challenging myself. Yeah, do write what you know, but also write what maybe you don't know or what or you know what's different to you to push you to make you do that work. Because mm-hmm. when you do that, the stories and the stories start to tell themselves some really wild stuff can happen. So yeah, that yeah, a story just started as a little commentary was like, oh no, it's a big monster story. So it's really exciting for me. Amazing. Well. Shane, Ted, thank you so much for joining us here on Spirits. People can pre-order Never Whistle at Night right now. And where can they find you both on the internet if they would like to continue to follow your work? Sure. Um, just my name.com. So shanehawk.com. You know, it's hard to know. Twitter was my main platform, but who knows the dumpster fire, if it's going to be extinguished or just keep burning. Um, I'm on different ones. It's really turning into a job to <laughs> yeah, check everything. Yeah. So just shanehawk.com. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a big boy website like that, with the myname.com. But right now I'm just TVA. So TVA and then just four Ys. So TVA everywhere. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Blue Sky. But yeah, I, I prom- I, here, I'm going to pledge right here. I will get a big boy website, so it's all. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much again. And remember, listeners, stay creepy. Stay cool. Yeah. Yeah.